All right. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Yeshua. We just declare your goodness. Father, we just want to say we love you. We thank you that in the midst of all the stuff that's going on in the world, that, Father, you're still there. And you remain faithful to us. And that, Father, we choose to be loyal to you. That we will not commit treason to your covenant and to your word. But, Father, to pursue you because you've pursued us. And so, Father, we come before you to ask that you would give us eyes to see today and ears to hear like we've not seen or heard before. That, Father, that you would inspire us, that you would encourage us. That, Father, that, that we would truly be lights in this world that really push back darkness and not be hidden under a basket. Father, these are things that Yeshua told us to do. Now, Father, we're asking that you light a fire in us so we would, we would burn brilliantly, Father, for you in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, so I wanted to, there, wanted to share a couple different things with you all today. I have had all sorts of things turning in my mind, and I don't know if you guys understand what it means to go through a time of when Father puts something on your heart and then you start chewing it up and you start to go through a preparation process because you know that it has to be delivered in a particular way. And, and then there's so much information. You're like, how do I deliver this? And so I'm just saying, Holy Spirit, you do it and you speak and you speak to our heart so that we can hear what you want to speak. But one of the things that's just really been on my heart lately has to do with some of the things that really began with this ministry. And so years ago, what started this ministry was a fire. I just want to put it that way. There was a fire that the Father put in us, and we're like, you know, we don't know how this is supposed to be done. And this is way before Life of Worship ever started, that Sandy and I were just attending other fellowships and congregations, uh, and that he had us serving in different places and doing different things. And yet there was a fire. And so much that's happened in the Hebrew roots, in the Messianic world, that sometimes we get our, our heads so much into the knowledge of things that we forget about the fire that got us going in the first place. And I think Yeshua says it this way, is that he, he rebukes one of the assemblies in, I think it's the church of the assembly of Laodicea. He says, I have this against you. You've lost your first love. And, and, I, and I think about it in my own life. I mean, all of us are busy and, you know, working work in a, a business and a job and all that sort of stuff. And then you know that the Father has this call on you. He's, and if you're a believer, he has a call on your life. Yes, he does. Every one of us has a calling. And I'm telling you, it's more than, than uh, attending a congregation. Yeah. There's ministry that's birthed out of congregations. But, but where we go, we have a light that has to be shined. It, it has to shine for it. If we don't shine that life, then we're not fulfilling the purposes for which he's called us. And sometimes that our life muddies up the message. And sometimes our interest and hunger in the, in the word and the father and, and all the great things that we see in it sometimes muddies up the purpose. I hate to say it that way. But, we, but when we put it in the right order, then we have clarity. Clarity of vision, clarity of purpose, clarity of what we're supposed to be doing, right? And I don't know about you, but I think a lot of us, and I'm speaking for myself, when I feel like I'm not fulfilling the purposes for which he's called me to do, then I start, then the enemy likes to take that and put shame on me and guilt. And, and I feel like, oh, I'm just not doing enough. Or, you know, the enemy's like, oh, you're not doing enough today. Did you do anything? Did you pray enough? Did you read your word enough? I mean, do you hear that thing that's on your shoulder? And um, so, so we got to make sure that we always keep that purpose clear before us. And uh, and praise y'all that He's given us a word. Sometimes we have so much other stuff going on that we want to know. We want to know what's going on in the world. We want to know what's. We want to know um, what revelation is being brought forth to the people. Because we want to hear a living word, a now word, a word that speaks to our heart, that encourages us. And we say, that's the Spirit of God. That's what God's doing right now. That's what I needed to hear. That encourages me. 
right? And we, we're encouraged individually, we're encouraged as a body. We, when we know that the Father's moving and he's doing great and powerful things, right? Which it brings out another question uh, that, that is like buried in, in the bottom of my notes here. But because I'm gonna, we're going to come full circle in this, but it has to do with this. Is, is in regards to the gospel. Think about this. Yeshua, over in, go, go with me over your word, over to Luke chapter 4. I want to tell you something as you're going to Luke chapter 4. When we started this journey in keeping the Shabbat, we moved our services from Sunday to Shabbat many years ago, there was a person, a couple that actually came and visited. He's passed away now. Visited life of worship, like on the first Shabbat, maybe the second Shabbat that we we had services, and he showed up, and and it's one of those things. As as a pastor, you're pretty sensitive to a lot of different things that are going on, and 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 apparently, you know, they had been in the Hebraic roots for quite a while, and when he their comment after they came and left and never came back again was, oh, it just sounds just, it just sounds like the church. And I was just thinking, well, why, not, why if you've had this walk, and this is me, just this is me talking, okay, this is me. If you've had this walk and walking it out and you came to see what was happening to this fellowship because God was doing a tremendous work, and you couldn't come and be something that could contribute to a, a people that are hungry for the word, but you came to criticize. Amen. And it broke my heart. I'm like, I don't want to, you know, have a word. Someone say, well, you're just not up to par. You're not up to speed where we are. And yet come in and say, you know, I can help. Amen. I can contribute. I can speak live. I don't have to have a platform, but I can just be here to encourage you. Like Richard and, and Celia, when they came, my goodness, they came and they stuck. But you know what they did? They weren't looking for a, a platform or a place. They just came and said, we can help. We can encourage. We can be here. They've been walking the walk for a while. so, And that's what they did. And, I, you know, I love that. I, I, and that was what was encouraging as a pastor that was like making this transition because when we made that transition and we lost 80% or, you know, of the, of the congregation and they were gone. I mean, we had a place that we filled up every Sunday and we, we barely filled up a few pews after that because we had our pews out at the time. Right, Joy? I was like, well, let's see where we're going to go from there. But I, I've never, now say with all that said, I've never lost the vision of what we're supposed to do. Luke chapter 4, when Yeshua is, is speaking, and he, uh, he began teaching, in verse 15 says, he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read, and the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of Yahweh. Now, I want you to just let that sink in and just say, now, put yourself in that position of Yeshua, because I'm going to tell you this. Are we not his hands and his feet and his voice in the earth today? All right. So when we open up the book and we read this, the spirit of Yahweh is upon me. Why? Because he has anointed me. Say he's anointed me. To preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim the release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set those who are downtrodden, um, uh, set free those who are downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of Yahweh. And he closed the book. 
It's like period, exclamation point. Like he's done. He says, this is what my purpose is. And this is what I'm here to do. And then he gathered 12. And what did he do? He taught them to preach that the spirit of the Lord was upon them. Because he anointed them to preach the gospel to the poor, and he sent them to proclaim the release of the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and set free those who are downtrodden to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Amen. Okay? And then he did something else. If you go over with me to Luke chapter 10. And it says, verse 1, now after this, Yahweh appeared, or the Lord appear, appointed. He appointed. When he appoints, he anoints. He appointed 70 others and sent them two by two, two and two ahead of him to every city where he himself was going to come. And he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you as lambs in the midst of wolves. In other words, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be some people that are going to bite. Carry no purse, no bag, no shoes, and greet no one on the way. And whatever house you enter first, say, peace be to this house. And if a man of peace uh, is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you and say to that house, uh, say in and stay in that house, eating and drinking what they give you. For the labor is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. Whatever city you enter, they receive you. Eat what they again. That goes on and on. And it says, verse nine, and, and heal those, and heal those, and heal those. Do I need to say that again? Yeah. <laughs> For emphasis. Okay, and heal those. Emphasis. I know. I, I do speak English too. And. Um, Heal those in, in it who are sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Now, I want to ask you this. Have you ever been challenged to you put your hands on somebody and heal them? Uh, there's a lot of people out there who are going to say, well, you can't heal them. But the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and He has appointed me, and He has anointed me to go forth. He appointed the 70 to go put two by two to go out there. They have, here's the assignment. Heal those who are sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter, they do not receive you. Go out into the streets and say, this is go on. And it, goes, and it, keeps, it keeps going on from there. But then... It talks about the results. And the seven returned with joy, saving, saying to the Lord, demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan, Hasatan, fall from heaven like lightning. And behold, I, would, I have given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall injure you. Now, if you look at, if you've been listening to what Sandy's been talking about on Psalm 91, on Walking in Spirit and Truth on Tuesday evenings, and you can go back and catch the archives on it, we were just talking about the serpents and the scorpions and the lions and the tigers and bear. Oh my. No, we were talking about, uh, we were talking about these things and why and what is it? What is it that, that he's given us authority to walk in and walk through, even to the point of talking about how governments don't have authority to touch us, that he will give his charge concerning us. I'm going to tell you this, even to the point of, if you look at that word over in Psalm 91, and it says that, uh, and we know that Yeshua was even tempted when, the, when Hasatan came to Yeshua and said, and he took him to the pinnacle, top of the pinnacle of the temple, yeah. and just cast yourself down because it says that he'll give his angels charge over you, that you'll not dash your foot upon a stone. Well, what is that about? Well, if you go back and you look at Psalm 91, where he's taking that word out of context, that's what Hasatan does. He likes to deceive and distract. He's been doing this since the garden. You know, we're not unaware of his, his little schemes. But it says he'll give his angels charge over you. Well, do you know what that word angel is? Because, you know, our Greek-minded thing, we think about this being with wings that flutters around and, and, uh, and that, that we're going to be carried off from one place to another place. Do you know that's a melech? It's a messenger for God. Some a a something that's been a 
a, something that's been put on dispatch from the throne. And that can be a person, it can be a king, it can be an emissary. It doesn't, it, it can be angelic. It can be all of those different things. But he's given what? Authority to open up doorways, even in an administration that would be hostile to our belief system. Amen. Shaul, Paul, what happened to him? He was thrown in prison. And from his prison cell, they took him into the king's palace. Now tell me if that's not an open door. Did he like his living quarters? Probably not. But he opened up ways that he had even favor that, they, that, that Yahweh spared his life in the midst of what he went through. Now was it fun? No. But there were open doors. Okay? Can you remember? Now think about I'm causing, you know, a lot of these different things, like I've said before, I'm just bringing up stuff you already know that we just need to remember. Zakar, we need to remember, because that's what it means to be fully who we are, is to remember who we are. And so, what is this message of the gospel, the message of the kingdom? Because if you go back to churchianity, what they teach in the church realm, and they think they talk about this, um, what what uh, the gospel is, it's about the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua, right? And you can go to every evangelical, but what's the message? The death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. But is that the gospel of the kingdom? No. And, and so that's where they leave it. That's where they, that's where they major on. There's nothing wrong with that. But when Yeshua said that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the gospel... What is it? Luke 9, 1, uh, 1 through 2 and verse 6 says, Then he, Yeshua, called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all the demons to cure diseases that had come upon them through, you know, uh, to cure diseases. He sent them to, to preach and to teach the kingdom of God, of Elohim. What, did, what was the message of the kingdom? It is the gospel. And, and to heal the sick. So they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. And then, of course, we went to Luke chapter 10, where it talks about the 70 being sent out. And then we know about the, the what we call the Great Commission, Matthew 28. And he tells them, I've been given all authority, now you go. Mark chapter 16 so it says the same thing, heal the sick. If you drink any deadly poison, it won't harm you. All of these miraculous things. I mean, think about that. This is... When we think about the gospel, the kingdom, we think of all these things that are encompassed in the Brit Hadashah. But it didn't begin in the Brit Hadashah. The gospel of the kingdom was from the beginning. Okay? Amen. Galatians 3.8 says in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel to Abraham. Well, what is this gospel that he preached? For, uh, 1 John 1, 1 through 3 and verse 2-7. Two, that which was from the beginning, Bereshit, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Yeshua the Messiah. Brethren, I write to write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you've had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning, from Bereshit. From Bereshit. When he says from the beginning, it's like, well, what beginning was that? Right? Was that when, you know, we got birthed? <laughs> or was he talking about from the beginning, Bereshit? And it, I would say from Bereshit. And so... What is the message that that was being preached? Well, let's talk about that. There's a word that comes from the Aramaic that is the word Mimra. Y'all ever heard the word Mimra before? Has anybody heard the word Mimra? No, it's in the Aramaic. I'm going to write it phonetically. 
because I don't know how to write in Aramaic, okay? So Mem Memra, and this is uh, the most common Hebrew expression. Well, let me put it this. This is in Aramaic the word for Devar, or some people might write it out as Devar, but, uh, but it means uh, it's the most which is the Hebrew expression for word. It means a word or a thing or a matter or an affair. Uh, so, devar implies content and reality in one's words. So think about that. Content and reality in one's words. So so let's, let's break it down. Content and reality in one's words. When I say this is a marker, it's not because it has a blue cap and a green cap because there's blue and green on the, on this thing. Uh, we're not, it's that form versus function, right? It's not because what it looks like, it's because what it does. That's the expression of a marker, is what it does. It puts some things on a whiteboard so I can write with it. And so, <coughs> keeping that in mind, I'm gonna give you an idea that's, that God is somehow untouchable. Think about that. All right, can you touch God? Like, can you grasp him and get a hold of him like you can grab my arm? Yeah. So there's a there's this reality of God that's untouchable. And so it's necessary to provide a viable link. So there's a, a reason that we, we need a link between Yahweh and his earthly creation. So what's the link? It's the Mimra. It's the Mimra. Uh, this is the what, uh, and so in ancient rabbinical thought, just keep this in mind, is that this is the word uh, where we get a connection with another word in the beginning called Amar. Can you see the similarities? Mimra and Amar. Amar. If you would go over to Genesis chapter 1, you're going to see in the scriptures where it says, and God said, right? Well, that word is mar, where we get amar, amar, the word, and God said, and God said, Memra. So in the ancient Aramaic, because so why do we talk about Aramaic when we always go look at the Hebrew? Because Aramaic was the word, was the language that was spoken at the time of Yeshua. Now, they would go to the synagogue, they spoke and they would read, uh, they, would, they would read the Torah scriptures from the Aramaic and they would read it in the Hebrew. But the language is Aramaic, so they always wanted to make sure that they understood, that the people understood the context of what they were talking about. In fact, the, uh, the Targum, have you ever heard the word Targum? The Targum is the Aramaic uh, scriptures of the Torah. And so there are various forms and versions of it. There's the Ankylos, or the Targum of, uh, of uh, Jonathan, Yochanan, and there's the Targum, there's a couple other Targums that are out there, and they, they would basically be the translation of the Hebrew scriptures into Aramaic. And in using that, they, there was the, this word, Memra, that would show up. The translation, though, was very interesting that gives us an idea and an understanding of what the gospel is all about. And that's where we're going to get to. So, this word memra, um, or actually the word amar, mar, is to say. The root was used through Genesis 1 when God said, and the material world came into reality and existence. So remember what I said about the word devar? Devar implies content and reality of one's word. So when God said, the world came into existence. The reality of what he said became physical matter before us something we could see uh, with our very eyes. The Memra concept was that the divine mediator, all right, between the unapproachable God and the creature, man, 
uh, occurs hundreds of times in the Aramaic Targum. So think about this. Now, Memra. Memra is not a word. Memra is a person. Because with this concept in the Aramaic, there is something that, that, that really begins to solidify. God's word has been of utmost importance ever since the first day of creation. Amen. And it's the primary, primary way that God, the untouchable being, implements his will. When God said, what did he do? His will was that light separated from darkness. That that a land formed from a, and separated with the waters, right? We have all these different things that he said. It also communicates and interacts with human beings and how he reveals himself in a way that can be understood. He gives us his word that we have within our scriptures so that we can have an understanding of who he is, right? It is so we have something that comes into the reality of our life in our world through what he spoke to us. Now, it's more than just the mechanics of having something printed on paper, whether it's human hand that writes it on paper or whether it's mechanically printed from a laser printer or an old-fashioned printer where they had to put all the letters in the order and all that sort of stuff. There is a process mechanically done we can understand that but in and of itself the mechanical word that we get to see which is good has no life in it except for the life that's behind it am i with y'all following me with all this right now okay if you're like oh, scratching your head just start scratching your head and i'll stop and we'll go back okay i'll understand that symbolism so more than just the ink and the letters we see more than what is a recording of what he said, what he's done, is this is, is in effect where his word is speaking from his heart to ours. Okay? So this is why when he breathes on his word when we're reading it, it becomes life to us. And we have an encounter with the memra. Okay, all right, here's, here, stay with me because we're going to get there. Because we can ask this concept or ask this question, you know, why did God even bother to speak into creation? Because if he's God, he could just do it, right? But instead, he chose to use a mediator to perform it. Okay, so he watches over his word his memra to perform it yes. okay so so we have a concept here we're getting there right his word therefore is an extension of his nature and a movement of his will alive powerful and effective not just letters syllables and sounds are you? Did you? I need to, Do I need? To, do I need to say that again? I'm getting tongue tied today for some reason. <laughs> so, like when he said, "Let there be light," it was a dim. It was an extension of his nature. There's light. Yeah. There is movement of his will because. Something was done, right? It's you, you choose to do something or you don't choose to do something. When you choose not to do something, nothing happens, correct? So he chose to cause something to happen because the earth was formless and void. It was full of chaos. So now, going along with this thought process in regards to these, uh, how these targums are, that... Um, and in the, in the, I don't like to say the Jewish belief systems, but in the Hebraic belief systems, okay, that Hebraic mindset, that God's word is an entity, and it's actually God himself. 
Okay, so at the time of Yeshua, that his disciples were listening, they understood this concept that that God, who was untouchable, sent forth his word, which was touchable. Right? And so because, therefore, if God, who gives himself and expresses himself as an extension of himself through his word that is touchable, therefore his word is an entity. Y'all with me? So therefore, when you see the word that is in the scriptures, then you start to see God in a physical form and fashion. And so now he has now brought heaven to us where we can touch him because he's expressing himself to us. All right, you're going to touch your word, but is that God? No, but we can touch it and feel the expression or sense the expression or know the expression or at the time of Yeshua, they can touch Yeshua or Yeshua touched many and healed them, right? And he's still doing it today. That's right. Okay, so follow me with this concept. So, so John, who wrote the book of John, has, if you want to go over with me to John 1.1, 1, 1, we're going to see how he understood the concept of the Mimra as they understood it and how the rabbis understood it in that day. Because today, if you talk to the rabbis about this concept, they're going to say, no, that's heresy. But the rabbis, rabbis during Yeshua's time said, I understand that concept. Because they understood Aramaic, and they understood in the Aramaic the concept of the memory. We're, going to, we're drilling down on it, because all of a sudden when we get there, you're going to go, oh my goodness, wow. You're going to see Yeshua in such a wonderful way from this. So John, who was schooled in the Targums, why? The Targums, when you think of the Targums, think this, this is the Torah in Aramaic. Targum means Torah in the Aramaic. And John, having studied the Targums, because why do you study the Targum? Because you go through the, the Torah portion cycles every year. And so several years of studying it through in the Aramaic, there's a concept when Yeshua arrives on the scene, he's like, oh my goodness. Wow, I get this, which leads us to why he wrote John 1.1 1, 1 in the beginning in Bereshit. Bereshit was the word and God said. In the beginning was the Memra. And the Memra was with God, and God said, right? God, who was untouchable, who, through this medium called the Memra, said, the Amar, to say this, which takes this vastness of God and puts an entity to it, things came in. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made without him. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So in modern Judaism, they would accuse John of borrowing his ide ideology from Greek uh, philosophy. They would accuse him of being a Greek. They're wrong. No, but he wasn't. He was reading simply from the Targum, the Aramaic translation of the Torah. And that's the concept that he's bringing forth, the word that was from the beginning. And which brings us to another uh, point is that, that uh, the belief back in John's day, that nothing said in that verse would have raised a single objection from any of his peers and contemporaries because that passage reflects 100% Targum teachings that were commonly dispensed in the synagogue, uh, synagogues of his day. So the Targums taught that God's word, the Memra, reigns supreme upon the Almighty's throne. That's what the Targums talked about. Now, if you're like New Testament only, you'll never see it. You won't get this concept. And if you follow the modern rabbis today, you won't understand this concept that the Memra reigns supreme on his throne. And who's the Memra? Well, we know. And so... Taking it to the next step then, how do we draw this connection? In the Targum of Deuteronomy 4.7, Deuteronomy 
in the Targum, it reads, For what people so great to whom the Lord is so high in the name of the word of the Lord? But the custom of other nations is to carry their gods upon their shoulders, that they may seem to be nigh them, but they cannot hear with the ears, be they nigh or be they far off. But the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, that phrase is very important, but the word of the Lord sits upon his throne, high and lifted up, and hears our prayers, what time we pray before him and make our petitions. The word of the Lord. See, it says the word of the Lord sits upon the throne. That's the understanding, the word of the Lord. So when John says in the beginning was the word, the word was was with God and the word was God, that was a concept that wasn't foreign to them. They didn't have to have a translation or a rabbi to teach them that because it was in the Targum. It was in their Aramaic uh, 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 translation. Think about this. According to the Targums, Jacob, who, of course, is a very important person to Israel, right? Would you agree with me? He worshipped the Mimra of God. What? He worshipped the Mimra? He worshipped the Word of God? You mean he took out a Torah scroll and bowed down to it three times? Daily or whatever? No? No, it means that it says in the Targum of Genesis 28, 20 through 21, and Jacob bowed a vow saying, If the Word of Yahweh, if the Mimra of Yahweh, will be my support and will keep me in the way that I go and I will and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the word of Yahweh be my God. Now, do we see that in our English translations? We don't see that, do we? But in the Aramaic, it says, then the word of Yahweh be my God. Well, who do we have? Do we have two different gods that they're talking about here? Are we talking about Yehovah, Yahweh, and the word of Yahweh as two different things? Or is one the reality of the other, the expression of the other? So Jacob says, I will, in other words, if Yeshua, as this, as, as Jonathan, John was talking about here, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was, was God, and all things, and through him, all things came into being. That the word of Yahweh, who's he talking about? So, if God's word is really this tremendous being, think about this. Whenever the Targum orators came to the passages where Yahweh is visible to humans, now think about this. In the Torah, they're writing. And they're translating it, and they say, whoa, Yahweh is visible to a human right here. I mean, think about the burning bush. Yahweh was visible to Moses or, or Abraham when Yahweh came and walked between the pieces, became visible. So keep that idea in mind. And let's... Uh, Whenever we have that, or whenever we have two or more Yahwehs that are indicated by the text, the Targman often substituted the word of the Lord for one of the Yahwehs. So it might say, Yahweh, this Yahweh. Okay, we'll get some examples here in a second. So it would take Yahweh, the word of the Lord. It would separate them out. It would say, Yahweh the, and the Memra. A lot of times we see it, you see it in portions where you see the olive tov that's untranslatable within the scripture. So here's an example, Genesis 19, 23 to 24. The Tanakh says, As the sun rose upon the earth and Lot entered Zoar, Yahweh rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah sulfurous fire from Yahweh out of heaven. Okay, there's a portion there where Yahweh is mentioned twice. That's uh, over in Genesis 19, 23 to 24. The Hebrew grammar here indicates that one Yahweh rained fire from another Yahweh who was up in heaven. The Targum substitutes the word of Yahweh for the first of the two Yahwehs as follows. So listen how they, they translate it. This is really cool, guys. 
And the word of Yahweh caused to descend upon the peoples of Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from Yahweh in heaven. So here you've got the two, Yahweh in heaven and the Memra. The word of Yahweh. Okay, here's, a, here's another one where in Exodus 20, verse 1, substituted the word of Yahweh in place of Yahweh. Okay, everybody knows Exodus 20, verse 1. This is the, the giving of the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, the Ten Debar. And the word of the Lord spoke all the excellencies of these words, saying, and the word of the Lord spoke all the excellency of these words, saying. So, uh, and that was out of the Jerusalem Targum. Here's what mine says. And then God spoke all these words, saying. Then God spoke all these words, saying. In the Targum, it says, and the word of the Lord and the word of Yahweh spoke all the excellencies of these words. And in that scripture, I actually have it in my notes in my, in my Bible, where it says, Then God, all of Tav, spoke all these words. So that's the untranslatable, all of Tav spoke. So we have the connection that Yahweh has actually spoken twice in this, in this past. It's the Targum that picked it up. Then Yahweh, <coughs> the word of Yahweh, or Yahweh, the Memra, spoke all these words. So I want to ask this question. Who spoke the ten words? <coughs> yeah, Yeshua. Okay, it's just kind of like little idiosyncrasies, but it's brought out because we of a different translation. Can you imagine that? That King Jimmy just didn't get it all right the first time around? Oh, my goodness. All right, let's go on. Genesis 15, 6 in the Targum. This is when the word of Yahweh whom Abraham trusted in. Because I want you to, whenever you hear the word of Yahweh, I think you, I think we should probably say we have Memra equals the Devar. I think we should come over here and say Memra equals Yeshua. Because I think that's probably a better way to say it. And that's why when we do the Shema, I always say Yeshua is Yahweh. That's why I say it, because it's all right here in the Targum. And so let's go down a little bit further. Genesis 22, 4, uh, Genesis 15, 6. And Abraham trusted, this is what it is in the Targum, and Abraham trusted in the word of Yahweh, and he, and he counted, he, Yahweh, counted it to him for righteousness. So Abraham trusted in Yeshua, and Yahweh counted it to him for righteousness. Did you ever think about that? Like in Romans where it says, and it's talking about that, that's, uh, that Paul is quoting the very same thing, that Abraham trusted in Yahweh and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It was by faith that we were saved. And we all have all these different things we say about that. It's his trust was in the word of Yahweh. That's how it comes out in the Aramaic, who is the word that was in the beginning, that was in John, 1 John 1, that we've been talking about. Okay, let's move right along. Here's another place. When Abraham prayed, how did he pray? He prayed in the name of Yahweh. So in other words, who did Abraham pray in? In the name of? Yeshua. So, uh, Genesis twenty two fourteen, 14. And Abraham worshipped and prayed in the name of the word of Yahweh. And said, you are Yahweh who does see, but you cannot be seen. So we see the two Yahwehs in this verse that Abraham was praying to. Abraham was praying in the name of Yahweh because, because Yahweh cannot be seen and is untouchable. Because he could see Yeshua walking between the pieces. Y'all with me on that so far? <clears throat> Excuse me. So moving right along. The Memra was a significant role in Abraham's covenant. Now see, this is why the gospel was preached from the beginning. In Genesis 17, 7, it says, I will establish my covenant between my word and between you. Genesis 17, 7, this is out of the Targum. And I will establish my covenant 
between my word and between you. Who is the covenant established between? Abraham and Yeshua. And then Exodus uh, 12, 42. On the second night, when the word of Yahweh was revealed unto Abraham between the divided parts, when Abraham was a son of a hundred years and Sarah was a daughter of ninety years. Isn't that interesting how they translate that? But so we're getting a, we're getting the English translation of the Aramaic, which is translated from the Hebrew. Oh. Okay. So when the word of Yahweh was revealed unto Abraham, we can see that who was the covenant with? What is that passage uh, re regarding? Wait a minute, I'm sorry. That was uh, Moses recalling it. When the word of the Lord, when the word of the Lord was revealed in Abraham bet between the divided parts. So we see that there is a revealing and a significant role that, that the word of Yahweh played with Abraham or played within that relationship there with Abraham. And according to another target, the word of Yahweh created man not only in the image of God, but also in the likeness of his word. Get this. I mean, think about this. We know that, that man is created in the image of God, right? Well, if God is without form, and we can't, right? So there's got to be something by which we're created in his image. What image then do we reflect? Well, that's that mystery is solved in the Targum, where it talks about where this word comes in, when the and the memra of the Lord, the word of the Lord created man in his likeness. The word of the Lord created man in his likeness. Who was that? Yeshua created man in his likeness. If you see that. Because if Yahweh is untouchable and cannot be seen, then what is the extension of Yahweh that we can see? It's Yeshua. So, and the word of the Lord created man in his likeness. In the likeness of the presence of the Lord, he created him. The male and his yoke fellow, he created them. Women, do you like to be called the yoke fellow? <laughs> I didn't write that. But uh, it's in the, ter the Targum. The English translation of the Aramaic Targum that's translated from the Hebrew. And the word of the Lord created man in his likeness, in the likeness of the presence of the Lord. So when you hear another phrase, there's something that's kind of thrown in there. The presence of the Lord is Yeshua. In the Targum, Targum of Exodus 3.14, And the word of Yahweh said to Moses. Who spoke to Moses? The memra of Yahweh the memory is Yeshua. The word of Yahweh said to Moses, I am he who said unto the world, be. And it was. And who in the few, what's he referring to? Genesis 1. And I am he who said unto the world, be. And it was. And who in the future shall say to it, be. And it shall be. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, is that impactful or what? Amen. Right? And he said, thus you shall say. If I'm the one that said be, and it was, and I'm, going, and I'm the one who will say in the future be, and it shall be, then you shall say. Because why? Because if you can look at man as, or you look at Yeshua, the word, as the extension of the Almighty, therefore he is the one that we see Yahweh because we see Yeshua. Think about how that, John who wrote that, if you see me, you've seen the Father, because I'm in the Father and he's in me and I'm in him. And you're in me. Now that gets really confusing. Okay, but then you can understand here, and he said, thus you shall say, Moses, to the children of Israel, I am sent. I am, or I, I am has sent me to you. So therefore, it makes me think about when Yeshua is in the garden and those and, and they come to arrest him, and they say, Are you Yeshua of Nazareth? And he says, I am, and they all fall over. Wow. How powerful that is, and how powerful that message is that Moses gave, that when he said, I am sent, ye, sent me to you, that they probably should have all fallen over, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay, because that is a powerful statement. 
There's a partial targum which expresses that the word of Yahweh was the creator. When I say partial, it's because it's a fragment that, was, that they found. And it's Exodus 12.42, and it says the first night. When the word of Yahweh, so the memory of Yahweh, the word is memory, who is Yeshua. When the word of Yahweh was revealed to the world in order to create it, the world was so desolate and void and darkness spread over the face of the abyss. And the word of Yahweh or the word of the Lord was bright and illuminating. And he called it the first night. Okay. Oh. Uh, now, did y'all do, do I need to say this again? Where it says, "And darkness spread over the face of the abyss, and the word of the Lord." Who's the word of the Lord? Yeshua. Yeshua. And the word of the Lord was bright and illuminating. Now, can we tie that to the Book of Revelation, where it says, "There is no need of a sun because Yeshua was the light, or is the light." The word of the Lord who is brilliant, illuminating. Oh, I think this is pretty cool because the memory is revealed in the Targum, which is a translation from the Hebrew, that they understood in the first century. So John could write, in the beginning was the word, the word of God. But I didn't give you the whole passage over that. Right? We'll have to get that here in just a little bit. But we'll tie that in here in a second because I get excited here. And it says, in, how about the memory as creator can also be seen in the Tanakh. So the memory is creator. Well, we think that God is the creator, of course, right? Yahweh is the creator. But memory as creator is revealed in the Targum. Psalm 33, 6, which says, By the word of the Lord. What's the word of the Lord? All right, you're catching on. It's the memory. It is Yeshua. The heavens were made by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. What's the breath of the mouth? It's the mouth, the breath of the mouth is the word going forth and is created. It's all over the Tanakh. Yeshua is all over the Tanakh. How anybody could ever depart from Yeshua knowing that he's revealed and this is the first century thinking that the rabbis taught from, from the Aramaic. That they were talking about the word who became flesh and they had him right there before him. So how can you miss that? So what do you do? Well, you just say, well, those guys didn't have it right because we rabbinics in the modern times uh, have better knowledge because we have more centuries behind us and bring in understanding. No, but when the translators translate it that way, they did it in order to separate, to understand that there is Yahweh and the word of Yahweh. One was the expression of the other. One you could touch, one you couldn't. Amen. How about this? The word of Yahweh. So we talked about that. Noah's covenant was between the memory and all mankind. In Genesis 9, 17, it says, And Yahweh said to Mo Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between my word and between all flesh that is upon the earth. Did you, do, you need, do you need me to say that one again? This is the covenant between the word, the memra, and all mankind. Who's the covenant between Noah and all mankind? Yeshua. Yeshua. This is the token of the covenant which I have established between my word, Yeshua, and between all flesh that is upon the earth. Wow. Noah's covenant was between Yeshua and all flesh. Memra, the memra is Israel's savior. This is Isaiah 45, 17 and verse 25. But Israel shall be saved by the word of Yahweh. Israel. So this is the word that was spoken to Isaiah to be spoken to us, to be spoken to the people of that time, that Israel shall be saved by Yeshua. But Israel shall be saved by the word of Yahweh with an everlasting salvation. By the word of Yahweh shall all the seed of Israel be justified. By Yeshua shall all of the seed of Israel be justified. Hmm. That makes me think that I'm a few generations down the road from the time of Isaiah. I think I would be considered a seed of Israel by which I can be saved. Amen. By the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. So here's here's how 
Hosea said it, Hosea 1 7. But I shall have mercy upon the house of Yehuda, of Judah, and I shall or I will save them by the word of Yahweh, their God. Did you catch that one? I shall, I will save them by Yeshua, their God. That was Hosea 1 7. Hosea 1 7. And I don't have the comparison to go back and forth, and hopefully you're just looking at the comparison yourself. And I will save them by the word of Yahweh, their God. And so, and according to the New Testament, now here's on the Brit Hadashah part of it, that I will have, mer uh, according to Brit Hadashah, skip, sorry, I skip. Um, Yeshua is the human manifestation of the Memra, and how do we know that? Well, several different things. I'll give you scripture to back it up. But I'm going to give you the concept first. The Memra became a human being from the tribe of Judah, who, though coming from God and must be spoken to as God and prayed to as God, and worshipped as God, and served as God, is itself subject to the real God. So think about that. This is Yeshua, the human manifestation of God, who became in human form from the tribe of Judah. Though he came from God, he's spoken to as God, he's prayed to as God, He's worshipped as God, served as God, and himself the subject to God. Because everything that I just went through earlier, Jacob worshipped the Memra. Abraham prayed to the Memra. We see all of the, the Memra is our salvation. Amen. All of these different things that I talked about, this is the concept that was before the people in the first century. It was Yeshua, which is the very reason that this is the whole purpose of understanding the gospel. This is the gospel that Yeshua preached. John 1.14. So we've been talking about John, uh, John 1, 1 through 3. John 1.14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the concept that they understood from the very beginning. And somehow we've lost in translation because King Jimmy began to reign in many of our congregations. You know, I, I you know, you know, there's the, the folks that are the King Jimmy only, I can say the King Jimmy, I just kind of make it fun, but um, the King James only people, it's okay, that's cool. But it's not doesn't have all the answers for us. John 6.38 says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. The memra from heaven, the one like we talked about when I first started, that that was the word that was the mediator, the divine mediator between the unapproachable God and the creature man. That he came down from heaven. For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. First John 1, 1 through 3. First John, first John 1, 1 through 3 says, That which was from the beginning, from Bereshit, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life, the life appeared we have seen it and testify to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the father and has appeared to us we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the father and with the son yeshua the messiah amen, amen. so when we think about the word of yahweh and we see that within context we understand in the Aramaic thought of the first century, they knew that that was God. 
So when John wrote that from the beginning, and he wrote this very concept that this is really that sowed level. We were talking about sowed level earlier in, in the Torah portion. The sowed level saying, look, this is the revelation of God on the earth. This is the one whom we preach. And this is the one who sent the disciples out. And that who is the very one that says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why is he? Why is he? The spirit of to what? To preach the gospel, which was the gospel from the very beginning. To heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out demons, to heal the leper, all of that, and to bring about a salvation or redemption. This is the message. This is the message from the beginning. And I want to tell you this. This is that which we need to really begin to revive. What is our first love there for? Our very first love, that which got us excited in the first place that ever brought us to Yeshua, that thing that captured our heart, that brought us in, that we had to go tell everybody about, what is it there for? Why is this brilliant light, the one who is the light, who revealed himself by, by declaring, let there be light? What was he saying? I am the word saying, I am light. Because I'm manifesting it on the earth, which brings it full circle around. In the new Jerusalem, he is the light. There's no need for sun. Why, what is it that we must do to make sure that light shines brightly within us so that when people see us and we, we are the walking testament, the walking witness of the Father on the earth, that they say, that is bringing what I need in this darkness. I'm telling you, there's a lot of darkness in the world. There's a lot of, there's a much reason. Somebody brought up earlier, I think it was Rex Santa was bringing up earlier, that we might not be seeing it right here in Amarillo, Texas, but there's great revival happening in the earth right now. Why is there great revival? Because there is great darkness. But what is the very issue about what revival is all about? Revival is about light that is shining in the darkness and it causes darkness to flee. It causes us to be able to see. As well, I think it was during Torah portion that Sandy was talking about. What is it about, about blindness, right? How is a blind man uh, the walking in darkness? You know, how does a blind man even know he's in darkness? Except the fact that, that the blind man knows in darkness that he needs to carry a light so that no one will run into him. And this is where we are today, is that in the darkness, we have to be the light because people are getting run over. Amen. Amen? All right. So I want you to be inspired that this whole concept in the first century is very much a concept that we've got to grasp today. Because once we understand that where we are today, then we can understand that who our purpose is. And we can revive that purpose and we can renew that purpose and new life can flow into that purpose and understand that we're, we're not just to come in here and fill a pew or, you know, warm up a chair or, 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 or simply to say, say, okay, um, I'm bringing a, a tithe and an offering so that we can keep the lights on. No, we have a purpose and that purpose is so that we can be a light. Amen. 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 All right, let's stand and we'll go close. Father, we come before you in the name of Yeshua. We thank you for the revelation of the word. The revelation of the word that, that, that came from you, from the throne. That was your very spoken word coming forth that we have no, now see why we can pray to Yeshua. Why we can see that we worship him. Because he is God. That we serve him because he is God. And that he is subject to you. Because when we see Yeshua, we have seen the Father. Because he and the, and the Father are one. Father, we just bless you for that. That there is no one like you. That this concept is not just a concept, but it's a living reality that we can touch, and we can feel, and we can connect with. And that is what we want to connect with you about. Father, we just bless you and we honor you today. May your peace be upon your people as we leave this place. And that, Father, that your, your protection, your wisdom, your wisdom for the, the day and the hour we're living in, these things that we are navigating through, that, Father, that we have your vision to see, that we are protected from all of the pestilences that are upon us, that which the enemy would try to throw at us, 
that, Father, that we are hidden in the shelter of the Most High and that we are protected because we have an emissary an ad, a, that has come from your throne to protect us. Blessed are you, Yehovah, King of the universe, who gives us such great blessing, the fruit of the vine and the bread of life. Amen and amen. amen. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.